This is Hiroshima. I did it in 1994. It was part of the war series. Uh, I believe it was the first painting that I did in that war series in my studio in Swedesburg, Pennsylvania. I had won the Pew Grant and I did the painting. Um, I wanted to do it. I, I love the title Hiroshima. I don't know if it was Hiroshima Mon Amour or what, but the, the, the idea of the painting originated with the title. And I did it after the bomb had dropped in Hiroshima. So the atomic bomb had dropped and everybody was dead and it was all a grisaille painting. Everything was black and gray and destroyed. I started reading uh, John Hersey's, while I'm working on the painting, I was reading John Hersey's uh, Hiroshima, the book Hiroshima, which is about uh, survivors in the, um, from the blast. And uh, there was one story of a woman who was uh, standing at her kitchen window the morning of uh, the blast, August 1945, and she's standing there looking out and um, the window and the mayor of Hiroshima had asked everybody in the town along certain avenues to tear down their houses so that if there was a bomb, a conventional bomb, dropped, that it would only burn just to so far and then the rest of the city would be saved. She was watching her neighbor across the street tear the shingles, tear the roof off of his house. She was sit standing there watching, watching this happen, doing, you know, to try to save the city. This guy was destroying his own house. And she's there and it's eight, 15 in the morning, eight something in the morning, and she's looking out and then suddenly this big yellow blast, the whole sky goes yellow behind her, behind the house. <laughs> 20, 30, 45 minutes later, she's waking up and she's standing up and she's shaking her own roof off of her, off her head, shingles off of her head, and she stands up and she's covered in dust. Everything in every direction is destroyed. The house across the street, all the other houses, her children who were sleeping on the mat behind her, gone. Everything was gone. She's just standing there in the middle of this wasteland. And at that moment, I realized uh, what I wanted to do with the painting was to bring it back in time. So to bring it back to before the bomb was dropped, to that moment just before the bomb was dropped, to back the reel up to the morning before that ever happened. So what would it be, hap what would it be like if we had never done it? So I, and just hold that moment forever. So I brought it back to uh, a beautiful, I, I set her outside because I didn't want her in the kitchen and I didn't want her in her house. It just didn't have the visual impact. So I put her in the rice field and I put her with her, with her friends and neighbors and I, and I had her little son behind her who had been sleeping on the mat. Uh, symbolic figure for, for courage with the carp kite, the carp kite which feels like an airplane, uh, airport windsock telling you the direction of the wind. Um, she, for a while, she had her hand up, actually. She was holding her hand up by her head, listening, listening to the sound of an oncoming airplane, the Enola Gay. You could hear it in the distance. And so what informed the paint, as I painted the painting, was the sound of a distant airplane, that you didn't know what that brought with it. You didn't know what it meant. She is raised up from picking the rice, and she's looking in the distance in the, toward the rising sun of the distant sound of the Enola Gay, and I let that inform every brushstroke in the whole painting and the whole sky. Underneath the painting, you can see where the destruction was. So I repainted everything. Uh, there's some things that are sort of left over, shadows of things that were there before, telephone poles that were knocked over, and things that they're still sort of there and not there. The vanishing point is, is here. That's the very center of the painting. That's where the uh, Peace Memorial is. That was where Ground Zero was. This is where they, right here is where they dropped the atomic bomb. And there's a structure that's still there. It's what they call the Peace Memorial. And here you see it uh, prior to its demolition. But it still remains as a skeletal, skeletal type building. So as they built Hiroshima back up around it, they left that building as a memorial. Uh, the, the painting uh, has the uh, influence of like uh, Im impressionist kind of landscape painting. A lot of sort of this, this kind of thing is left. These, these things that are actually like bamboo trees in the distance were actually just drips of paint. Uh, when I painted the sky and it just sort of dripped down, I just left them. So I wanted to feel very uh, wet and moist. A lot, of, a lot of drips. I've probably seen some Anselm Kiefer paintings and like you know, trying to let some of those drips be part of the, the touch. I made the boy transparent not unlike the way I made the wife transparent in um, Object Permanence. Um, 
because I, I wanted that sense of he would be gone, that he's sort of a ghost figure, a little bit like the boy that's kicking in Damascus Road. He's um, you know, sort of there and not there. It's, it's something ethereal about him. It's the tentativeness, it's the, uh, how everything is sort of uh, gonna pass away. And so he's transparent. And uh, you know, literally I had the feel there first before I decided to add him. So I added him on top of it. And I got it to this point and I thought there's no need to make that more opaque. There's no need to make that a real jacket. Let it, let it breathe. But I was real happy with the way that this, this carp kite turned into a windsock. Where it was sort of like really um, echoed the idea of the plane coming. I had to go all the way the other way once I'd had it uh, after the destruction, after the bomb drop, when I, when I wanted to bring it back to a beautiful clear morning in, in Hiroshima. So I had uh, taken a model, I'd taken my friend out, actually uh, uh, Mia Nakashima posed for this. Her, uh, her, her father was a great woodworker. He actually did the, the um, table, United Nations, the peace table, a Nakashima a wooden table. But her father uh, did that table, made that table and uh, the peace table, and she posed for that figure. Um, but I had a model go out along the Delaware River in Philadelphia with me in the morning, exactly the right time, at 8, 14, or 8, 16, or 8, 15, whenever the bomb dropped. And so this, this factory here is actually uh, a riff on the, the factory that was along the river. I think it was a refi refinery, or sugar refinery factory. Um, is not in Hiroshima at all. So it's a combination of places. But that light that was out there that morning, exactly at the right time, the right day, was exactly the feeling that I wanted uh, to capture. And so I had the painting painted, and it was pretty far along, and I realized it wasn't glowing the way I wanted. So I had a study for it, and I actually uh, uh, dipped my brush into Indian yellow. Indian yellow is actually made with uh, ox urine, so it's very yellow. And transparent. And I dipped it into that and I wiped it across the whole painting and I realized that's what could make it glow. So I did, a, I hit it on the study first and then I did it on the whole painting. It was a very, for me at the time, it was a pretty bold move to like change a painting's chroma completely. But that, that universal glow is just a glaze of Indian yellow, which is extremely intense yellow.